Hello, everybody. I'm Carl Olson. I'm the editor of Catholic World Report, and it's my great pleasure today to be talking with Larry Chapp. And Larry is uh, a theologian. He was a university professor for many years, and he is, a, uh, in addition to a, being a regular contributor to Catholic World Report, he writes for a lot of other publications, and he is the author of this wonderful new book from Ignatius Press, Confession of a Catholic Worker, subtitled our current moment of Christian witness. Uh, Larry, welcome. Great to be with you. Hey, thanks, Carl. It's always great to talk to you, especially you know, uh, I get to engage in same, shameless self-promotion here. <laughs> yes, we're all about that here, but that's <laughs> always good when you're promoting something as wonderful as this book. Now, I know, Thank Larry, you. you're very self-deprecating, and one thing, uh, many things I really appreciate about you is you're very, you're very honest, you're very open, uh, there's no, there's no baloney with, uh, with you. And I really, I like that. And this book is very, um, it really captures, I think your thought and the way that you approach so many different things, culture, theology, the faith. Um, and so we're going to definitely jump into that, but I want to start by noting that your book in many ways draws very heavily upon or refers often to this great book, I try to show it there without the glare. Mm-hmm. Hansers von Balthasar, The Moment of Christian Witness. Now, you state in the book that you first read it, I believe, in what year was it, 1989? Is that what you said in the book, Some, in the late 80s? Yeah, in the late 80s was the first time I read that book, just as I was beginning my doctoral studies at Fordham University. And did you, did you read it uh, in the original German then? Because I think it was later published in 1994 in English, correct? Yes, I read it in German because okay. I... Basically. If you want to, if you want to continue this conversation in German, we can do that. Uh, sadly, my German skills are not what they once were when I was a young and spry young graduate student. But uh, I want to say, I want to say though that this book, um, you know, there obviously von Balthasar wrote an immense amount. Uh, he has this huge trilogies, uh, really heavy duty theology. But the thing, one thing I really like about von Balthasar is he wrote really short accessible, pithy, direct books, too. He was yes. really uh, amazing in that regard. What When you first, and I want to basically ask you, what was it about this book that initially captured your attention? And then in what way did it inspire your book? Well, the first reason it captured my attention was because when I was starting doctoral studies at Fordham, Fordham was heavily run Aryan, deeply run Aryan in a, in a kind of extremely progressive liberal register. And I knew that the, uh, Balthazar's book, quoted Ode de Ansvel, you know, or Moment of Christian Witness, uh, had a, a strong sort of polemic against Rahner in there. And so I initially was drawn to it because I wanted to read what everyone was telling me was this brilliant polemical takedown of Rahner. Uh, that's actually ended up being my least favorite part of the book, precisely because I think it is a bit uh, polemical. But there's reasons for that historically. It was written and written in the late 60s when a liberal Ranarianism was ascendant and Balthazar had some points to make. But what really, as I read the book, what really captivated me and the reason why I decided I wanted to sort of write a, a kind of update of it was its emphasis on the fact that the modern Christian faces a choice that is unavoidable, uh, a, a grave sort of choice. And that was the point of the story of, of Cordula, who was, you know, with some virgins who were seized and were all martyred, but she hid. But the next day she came out and made a decision. I have to die with the others. And so Balthazar says, we, and he calls this the Ernstfall, which is a German word that means a sort of moment of decisional crisis. That's the leitmotif of the first half of the book, which of, Ron, of, of Balthazar's book. Mm -hmm. and, and it is a leitmotif that then drives home the point that Christian existence must be cruciform, has to be ready for martyrdom, especially now in the modern world. This is Balthazar's point. And it's not just his point. It was a point that I had already begun to read in Newman, in C.S. Lewis, in literary figures like Bernanos from Guardini and so on. Uh, even Rahner said the Christian of the future has to be a mystic or that he won't be a Christian at all. Lewis says in the modern age, Christians are like an egg. We either have to hatch or go bad. Stasis <laughs> is impossible. Stasis is impossible. Yeah. The choice not to choose is a choice. You cannot sit on sort of fence sitting, uh, bed hedging, 
sort of cul-de-sac beige Catholicism, as Bishop Barron calls it, is simply no longer viable. And I saw in Balthazar's book this profound emphasis on martyrdom, cruciform Christian existence, holiness, and all of those things are things we have to choose deliberately or we will not survive the coming tsunami. And the term cruciform here is really important because the thing about von Balthasar is he's so Christocentric. It really is about yes. that, that yes. choice ultimately is about choice for Christ, which you take up obviously uh, in your book. I'm going to, uh, you, mm -hmm. you kind of hinted at the, um, this time of, we live in a time of crisis. Von Balthasar talks about it being a time of crisis. What, what is the nature of this crisis? And how do you, how do you kind of define that crisis and approach that crisis in your book? Because you indicate it's not necessarily what a lot of people think it is. Yeah, I, I indicate what I think is the nature of the crisis in, in the title the, the chapter titles where I first two or three chapters, if memory serves, use the word nullification uh, in, in the in the title. It's it's similar to Pope Benedict's notion uh, that modernity is characterized by the eclipse of God, uh, but sort of building off of that and then delving deep into Balthazar's book, what what emerges is the idea that of, that latent within modernity is a deep nihilistic atheism, not just an atheism, a nihilistic atheism, a meaninglessness, a profound, profound meaninglessness, sort of Nietzsche on steroids. <laughs> and that what this eventuates into is a cultural ordo in which we all swim and we're all affected by it. And don't fool ourselves if, if we think we're not, where the question of God isn't simply uh, rejected. It's simply ignored and nullified as an ongoing concern so that, you know, it, it, at least, for example, as, you know, as I say, in, in the French Revolution, the French actually took Catholicism seriously enough to kill priests, you know, <laughs> enshrine a goddess at Notre Dame Cathedral and so on. They, they took the church seriously. Now the church, even if it's allowed to exist, is simply treated as an ir a complete irrelevance. The faith is treated as an irrelevance. And, and you know, as Cyril O'Regan says in a great Church Life Journal article, going all the way back to, the, to uh, talking about Cardinal Newman, writing in the 1830s already, noting that modernity is characterized by what the French call a change in mentalité, uh, a complete sea change in human consciousness. Not only do we no longer think about God, we in many ways were no longer capable of thinking about God. This is the essence of modernity. It robs us, as the, as the sociologist Peter Berger says, it robs us of the plausibility structures that sustain the very question of faith. As it, it, you know, cultures define what is the most really real for us. Uh, whether we like it or not, it does. It's, it's in our mother's milk. It's in the air we breathe. And the really real for us has no room for God. It's, it, it, God is just a complete irrelevance. Even if we have God in our lives there, if we go to church, it tends to be a veneer. It tends to be extremely superficial and ultimately simply a lifestyle choice that then becomes accommodated to our various cultural values because our plausibility structures are all oriented towards the nullification of God as an ongoing, an ongoing, meaningful, real thing. And we don't attend in real ways to things that we don't think are real. Uh, and that's stronger than simply saying, oh, we have a nation of agnostics and atheists, because agnostic and atheists are still capable of taking the God question seriously. Right. You know, right. as as you know, every age gets the atheism it kind of deserves. Every age of faith spawns its own antithesis in an age of it, it, in, in the atheists that ape it. Uh, and so, you know, back in the day, we had thundering atheists like Nietzsche. And, and today we have the the the. I mean, where are they? they? We just simply have, we have technocrats who just don't even attend to them. Whether they're atheists or not is irrelevant to them. Yeah, it's uh, not. It's not even a. It's not even an issue. It's not even a question. It's no. They um, don't care. And you, and you you talk uh, at great length in the book about the nature of modernity along these same lines, where modernity is characterized by this change in mentality, where God is just. In fact, it's almost like, well, sure, you can believe in God, but that has nothing to do with how we actually live our lives. It kind of remi reminds me of what Schmemann wrote about 
in the early 60s saying the, the essence of secularism is not so much a direct renunciation of God. It's actually just a refusal to worship him. Exactly. And I think that goes along with what you talk about in the book about modernity, the nature of it. How would you describe, you've, you've talked about some of it, but modernity. And then are you, would you say that you are, you know, anti-modern? I mean, is your book proposing some kind of an anti-modern project or, or is that a, how would you define that? Person? You know, that's a, that's a good question in terms of, let's begin with the latter part of that, whether uh, you know, is my book laying out some sort of anti-modern project. I don't, I don't think so. It's not an issue I deal with specifically in the book. Hey, we need to reject modernity and all go back to some sort of paleo conservative agrarianism, you know, even though I live on a farm, you know, I do like airplanes, flush toilets and antibiotics. <laughs> Electricity. I'm on an, yeah, electricity. I'm on an antibiotic right now for a sinus infection. All right. So, yeah, I, 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 avail, I avail myself of, of here I am on the interwebs with you. Uh, and so it would be the, the, the rankest form of hypocrisy for me to sit here. And I don't say it in my book that that the modern world is, we, we, you know, is evil and we can't just become Catholic Amish. All that being said. OK, so what is the, the, the gravamen of my complaint? And it is this, not so much that technology is inherently evil or the, 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 the comforts of the modern world are inherently evil because they're not. In many cases, they're positive goods. You know, London developing a sewer system was a really good thing. Otherwise, the Thames would have continued to be just an open cesspool. OK, these are all these are all true advancements and it helps hygiene and health and all those. And we're all happy that we don't live in those situations. What I mean by modernity, therefore, is, is a change in how we think about things and, and that we have to be careful because technology is part of that change and how we think about things. And so the deep question that many philosophers of technology have, have raised is, you know, the medium is the message. And to, so to a certain extent, all of these comforts of the modern world do carry with them a price in the sense that now our gaze is very bourgeois. And I use this word a lot in my, in my book. It's very bourgeois. Berdaev and others, Dorothy Day, have defined, the, and Tracy Rowland even, uh, mm -hmm. defined the bourgeois as a, and Del Noche is the, a sort of cult of material well-being where what used to be thought of as penultimate realities you know, the material comforts, material well-being have really become the ultimate goal of human life. And this is what characterizes bourgeois cultures. And that's why we concern ourselves almost endlessly with the GDP and unemployment statistics and economics reign supreme and so forth. And not the God question, not moral issues. Whatever stands in the way of economics is considered a bad thing. So I, I digress a bit, but this this gets to the to the essence of the modern soul, which is very naturalistic. It's not so much anti-supernatural, is that its focus is so much on this world and purely natural, naturalistic categories. And everything that we know and understand about ourselves and the natural world is analyzed through the lens of very secular, naturalistic disciplines, psychology, sociology, evolutionary biology. And if Jesus comes in at all, it's just sort of sprinkles, as Bill Portier says, Jesus sprinkles on top of the secular ice cream. Uh, and, and, and so this is what technology and modernity has, in a sense, created. It's created this web this 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 of, of well-being material well-being this has sort of become a cult of well-being that has so changed our mentality and so focused us on this world this is what charles taylor means uh, uh, in his book secular age about how we live now in an imminent frame mm -hmm. uh, rather and that, and that we have buffered selves against the transcendent yeah. uh, and and you know, ancient human beings pre-modern human beings had porous selves we lived in a world where trend where the vertical and the horizontal intersected in, in the sacraments and so on. And so even though we remained on this level, we were porously open as selves to other human beings and, and to God, whereas modernity now collapses transcendence in, into pure imminence. And so you actually get now religions of pure imminence, as Del Noche notes. Uh, and, and so you get a spirituality that is devoid of transcendence. So this is how even our religion has been influenced by the modern mind. And you see this in the modern Catholic Church uh, with, with, you know, the German synodal way and other, and other things going on in the church 
where the emphasis is completely on the horizontal plane. It's almost as if grace doesn't exist. Yeah. I mean, you know, listen to the, I don't want to get way off down this rabbit hole, but listen to the German synodal way. It's, I mean, where, where is talk of repentance, conversion, grace, yeah. <laughs> redemption, God, resurrection, heaven, hell, eschatological realities? No, no, it's LGBTQ that, rainbow this, women priests. You know, it's all this sociological, political, horizontal plane stuff. All right. And, and that's what I mean by modernity, this this focus on the material, on the horizontal at the expense of the transcendent. And that comes at great cost. And, and the funny thing is, as you're saying that you're describing, you know, no, uh, nothing about sin or grace. Or, I'm thinking and on the flip side, it's just the, the flip side of the same coin. We have, say, like Joel Olstein. It's the same <laughs> kind of thing. Right. Yeah, it's just yeah. it's it's a kind of an ah shucks down home. God wants to give you three cars, big house, because he wants to, ra you know, just pour yeah. out his blessings on you uh, in, in a weird way. Those two things, even though they seem polar opposites, are actually part of the same flattened uh, world where you don't. And, I, you know, and yeah. when uh, Cardinal McEnroy wrote his recent couple of pieces, he mentioned he used the word grace a lot. And I'm actually going to be writing an article about this. But he uses it in a very vague way. He never doesn't really talk about it in terms of what grace actually does, what it's meant to do, which, of course, is to completely and radically transform us, make us into actual sons and daughters of God, etc. Yeah, um, it's, a it's supposed to be a sharing of the divine life. That's what grace yeah. is that elevates yeah. us by, in a sense, helping us to overcome our sins. But in McElroy, it seems to have been reduced to a therapeutic category yeah. of, of God as an avuncular, senile you know, person in the sky who tosses us quarters to buy ice cream, no matter how bad we've been, you know. <laughs> well, that brings us to uh, one of the big focus uh, points in your book. And of course, it's in the subtitle, our current moment of Christian witnesses. Then how do we witness? How do we evangelize? How do we speak to unbelievers or those who don't even care? I think that's, the, you know, that's one of the most difficult ones is people who have no interest. It's like, Whatever. That's your thing. This is my thing. What are some yeah. what are some points that you make? You you make some really interesting points about this in the book. I I think these sections in the book are the worth the price alone where you talk about this because I think you you uh, blow some holes in kind of some common approaches. Um, what are some ways yeah. that you approach witness and evangelization that things that we need to recognize uh, in today's world? Yeah, I, I think the as you've just correctly pointed out with regard to Joel Olstein and, and, and others like him, there, there is a, there is this thread of horizontalism that is going to lead to a, a, a an ineffective evangelization. And you see this in progressive Catholicism that mistakenly thinks if we just ape the world, uh, what the world says that the world will come rushing to our feet. No, the world simply says, welcome. It's about time you gave up your illusions uh, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the, the sort of traditionalist approach, which wants more hell cowbell. And I, I don't want to caricature the. I'm always accused of caricaturing the traditionalist. But come on, just watch a little YouTube. I'm not going to mention names because I don't want hate mail. Uh, but you go out there and, there, you know, among the trads, there is this notion that unless we believe most people are going to hell, we won't evangelize. You know, unless we have the return of the Latin mass, the church is going to go, you know, downhill fast and so on. I, I, I think these this is also a non-starter. Uh, and it's, it's an appeal to a kind of romanticized past. Not all are like that, but many are. Uh, but then also the, uh, an approach that I, that I go after is a kind of sort of neocon approach that says we just need to double down on good catechesis and good doctrine, and we need to inculcate good Republican virtues, Boy Scout virtues. Uh, it, let's focus on America here, you know, because America is actually a crypto-Catholic country, our constitutional principles. You know, this is John Courtney Murray's thesis, right? Our constitutional principles are rooted in English common law, which were rooted in medieval notions of this, that, and the other thing. So actually our constitution was sort of written by Aquinas, you know, 10 steps removed. Uh, the, the, and so all we need to do is, in a sense, 
This is the Catholic moment, as Father Newhouse said. And so we just need to educate our fellow citizens that they're actually always, al they've always already been sort of Catholic and to sort of just put forward good doctrine and, and, and so on. And, and, and I have a certain, a certain respect for that. Uh, I, I used I used to sort of believe in a version, a sort of a, a version of that. Uh, nevertheless, I, I think those are all deeply flawed approaches in their own way. And my what my own approach emphasizes is uh, to use a cliched, much overused term is simply a, a, a radicalization of of our living. Of course, radical goes from the you know the, from the Latin root radix which means root, to go to the root of things. This was Dorothy Day's vision. This was the vision of Balthazar de Lubach, Rod Singer, all the great resource month thinkers. We, know, we need to go back to the sources of scripture, the fathers, the entirety of tradition, in order to, in a sense, um, to sort of reinterrogate our own faith from within. Uh, and to do so through the lens of the unbelief of the modern world. And therefore, we need to develop empathetic structures within us, empathetic feelings for our fellow human beings to truly enter into the sufferings of our age, which is an age of unbelief, an age of the nullification of God, and to reinterrogate the sources of our faith through that lens, and then to live lives of personal holiness that show the world that grace is real. You can't preach the talk if you don't walk the walk. OK, and so we have to live lives of personal holy, holiness. We are going to be cruciform. All right. And, and that and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be out on a soapbox. It doesn't mean you have to be a missionary. It doesn't mean you have to be a priest or a nun. It means in our current context, living with sanity uh, <laughs> and, and resisting B.S. And, uh, you know, to, to get married, to have children, have children, have 10 children. You know, have eight children, whatever it is, and don't don't be afraid. Uh, and 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 to wherever you are, uh, to wherever you are, to live the. I'm being kind of vague here, uh, but but to to walk that walk, and then you 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 become a kind of provocation. I remember I heard a talk once by the uh, French communio thinker Jean Luc Marion, theologian. Uh, he was giving a talk at a Fides at Ratio conference held by Dave Schindler in Washington, and Marion was talking about sex, and, and he goes, it, it won't be too much longer before Catholics will be the only ones doing it the old-fashioned way, uh, <laughs> you know, meaning no techno sex and so forth, and actually having babies and getting married and, and all that. That sounds, you know, who would have thought 20 years ago even that simply affirming that marriage is two heterosexuals and that it's one of its chief aims is to have kids and God bless you if you have lots of them, uh, that, that that would be an act of radical holiness <laughs> that, and, you know, and that's what I'm talking about, you know, so. and, to, and to not just and to, and to both. Uh, one way I, I think of it is to both speak the truth about the human person, which of course, something that John Paul II really emphasized and in speaking the truth, live that truth. Yeah. And this is what you're talking about. You know, if you're if you're married, yeah. pursue, pursue your marriage with a reality of what it means to be a man and wife. If you're single, you pursue that with a reality of what yeah. it means to be a chaste single person living in, a, in an age of nihilism and depravity. And, and so to both speak it, but to then the, the strongest word is to to actually live it. And we're seeing now in 2023, um, that's becoming more and more daunting and yet at the same time it seems like there's a, there's a real clarity right in our, our age oh, yeah. of... and the clarity is important the, uh, uh, one of the aspects i think of holiness which is key to evangelization for, for for even lay people today is is we have to be exposers of of idolatries i don't want to say falsehoods that that has a sort of syllabus of errors ring to it syllabus of errors was fine in its time but now is not a time for a syllabus of errors but we are in the church and outside of the church, living in Augustine's libido dominandi, we are living in a, in a deeply idolatrous age, yeah. an idolatry that has now created so many illusions. You know, a, a man can get pregnant, a woman can, you know, have a penis and so on. So many insanities uh, along these lines that we have to be, even as lay people, educated. We have to be educated Catholics today 
read, darn it, read things so that you can be an exposer of BS. You can be an exposer of idolatries. And that means outside of the church and inside of the church. So there has to be this prophetic quality to modern evangelization. More than simply preaching the catechism, preaching the faith. There, I've laid out the gospel for you. This goes all the way back to my years as a teacher in the classroom. You, you cannot simply begin with the gospel anymore. You have to begin by first deconstructing all of the BS, all the, the as I say, the script that is in their head. You have to flip that script. Yep. And the only way to flip that script is to, in a sense, go after the idolatries of our age, both in and out of the church. And that has to be done. And this is where it's more art than science. It has to be done in, in a way that's actually not harsh or aggressive or you, you jerks are all you know, wrong. Uh, it goes back to that empathetic moment I was talking about. You have to know your sort of, I hate to use target. You have to know their unbelief and to own it better than they do. This goes it captures something that uh, years ago when I was editor of Envoy magazine working with Patrick Madrid, Patrick would like to say that apologetics, true apologetics is simply removing obstacles. Yes. And I think there's a real profound nature to that because what he was saying, if you think about it, is in order to remove an obstacle for somebody, you actually have to know what the obstacle is for them. And that yes. means you actually have to listen to them. And then Absolutely. you have to actually engage with what they perceive to be the truth. And you have to actually work at addressing that with, as you say, empathy, clarity, firmness. But, you know, and I, I think this section of your book and you, is really uh, fantastic. We just have a, a couple. I, I knew this was going to go fast, Larry, because anytime we talk, time flies because it's always so fantastic. I'm just going to have one more question for you. This goes to your final chapter of the book where you talk about a hermeneutic of kenosis. Let's uh, conclude, like, just what is a hermeneutic? I mean, this is big words, you know, hermeneutic of kenosis. What yeah. Is, yeah. What is I, mean, that? I mean, do you actually want people to read your book, Larry? Why are you throwing out these big words like this? Come on. I've gotten some criticism of people saying, you know, your book has audience confusion. It's a no man's land between popular writing and sort of theolo deeply theological writing. And that's me. That's I my think blog. That's I think that's the strength. I think it's that, that's that's my style. I simply write what I want to say in, in the plainest English I can. But sometimes. I have a large vocabulary and I use it and, and there's a thing called Google use it. And, and, you know, and, and so I don't, I don't try anyway, I try to avoid the weirdest sort of stuff, but anyway, so hermeneutic simply means sort of your theory of interpretation and kenosis is a Greek word that St. Paul uses. That means sort of to descend, to go down into the depths of something. And so Paul says, Christ, you know, you know, descended into the human condition, all right, took on the form of a slave that he used the word kenosis. And, and so for us, theosis, becoming like unto God through Christ involves imitating the kenosis of Christ, his descent all the way down into the damned. Now, the reason why I call it, therefore, a hermeneutic of kenosis, I'm, I'm really talking about how do we approach the tradition? Uh, how do we interpret the tradition, especially in light of Vatican II, the traditionalist critique of Vatican II, the, pers the progressive misuse of Vatican II? And a lot of people, you know, you've got, you know, as Pope Benedict said, you've got those who want a hermeneutic of rupture, that the council was this rupture with the past. Then you have those who advocate for a strict hermeneutic of continuity. There's nothing to see here, ma'am. Just move along now. Vatican II I said everything the same, just in different words. Uh, and that's not true either. Tom of Monsignor Guarino at Seton Hall in his wonderful book, you know, The Disputed Teachings of Vatican II shows quite clearly that Vatican II does, in fact, uh, you know, roll back certain and, and so roll back certain traditional ideas. And therefore, Pope Benedict eventually starts talking about what he calls the hermeneutic of reform that involves continuity in uh, discontinuity and continuity, that all councils represent a certain micro rupture with the past in order to reaffirm a deeper continuity with broader elements of the tradition. Then Ratzinger goes on to talk about a hermeneutic of the cross. And that got me thinking, all right, if you read the Second Vatican Council very, very clearly, and it's especially Dei Verbum on Revelation, what becomes clear is that what the council is doing is what on, on, a, on an ecclesial scale is what I said we need to do as individuals. The council is reinterrogating the tradition hmm. and it is doing so through the lens of a kind of hermeneutic of the cross. 
Gaudium et Spes 22, only in the light of Christ does the mystery of man make sense. Well, Christ's existence is cruciform uh, before it is risen. It's risen, but cruciform. Okay, And therefore, if we want to truly analyze what is a human being, what is human history, and therefore, what is revelation, and how is the church interpreted, we need to re-interrogate tradition in the light of the cruciform Christ, and to ask ourselves the questions, to, in a sense, to reorient our hierarchy of doctrines based on which doctrines point us towards the cross and cruciform existence and which ones kind of detract from that. And I think that's what the council was doing. Mm-hmm. And, and so I call it a hermeneutic of kenosis. It's not perfect. It has its flaws. It needs developing. But it's a kind of seminal idea that I just toss out there. Well, thanks, Larry. Uh, our time is up here. Folks, it's uh, Larry Chap, Confession of a Catholic Worker. Our current moment of Christian witness, new from Ignatius Press, fantastic book. You'll you'll be challenged in reading this. You'll learn a lot in reading this. And uh, Larry, I always appreciate you taking time. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Carl.